All right. Well, if you are not there, turn with me to the book of John. And this morning, we're going to continue. Jesus started an illustration in John chapter 10. So if you're not in John chapter 10, go ahead and grab there. He started this illustration on shepherds and sheep. Now, this is so far removed from our culture. I mean, like I said, the closest I've gotten to a sheep is like eating lamb, right? I mean, that's the closest I've gotten to a real sheep or a petting zoo. I keep forgetting about that. But I don't know how shepherds interact with sheep. I don't know what Jesus is drawn at. But Jesus' audience knew. They've seen this every day of their life. They grew up in a culture that represented this. Now, remember, just context, we're still in the same trip to Jerusalem that Jesus started back in John chapter 7. It feels like we're 14 years down the road because we are 14 years down the road in the series of John. But, but, but technically, the trip started in chapter 7. He's still on this trip. This is just a few days after the feast of the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles. And it's a, a day or two after Jesus healed the blind man born from birth that we read about in John chapter 9. And as we said, the blind man's excu- excommunication from the synagogue, we saw that at the end of chapter 9, just thrust him into the arms of the good shepherd. That was the whole purpose of John chapter 9. So now ja- uh, chapter 10 is going to be a commentary on John chapter 9. It's going to explain the idea that the, that the Jewish religious leaders thought they were kicking this man out of the synagogue. And what was really happening is Jesus, as his shepherd, was calling him out of the sheepfold to himself. And so we see a different perspective here given uh, in John chapter 10. And this is really an illustration of Jesus' entire ministry to the Jewish people, at least the first six verses. But guess what? In verse six, we see the Jewish religious leaders, they didn't get it. Now they got, they got shepherd and sheep. They knew that. They saw, they've seen that. They knew what Jesus was talking about. They didn't know the application that Jesus was trying to make. Have you ever, in fact, have you ever heard someone speak and they tell an illustration or they try to give you an example and they finish and they're like, they're kind of like, yeah, so there. And you're like, what are you trying to say? Like, I don't even understand what what point you're trying to make. That's kind of how they reacted to Jesus here. They just don't understand. Okay, yeah, sheep, shepherd, I get that. What are you trying to say about it? Jesus in verse seven is gonna now circle back and he's gonna start to define and explain what does he mean by this metaphor? And I said this last week, and I'll bring it up again. The, the fact that he's using this figure, this shepherd sheep figure, is so powerful if we understand the use of the same figure in the Old Testament. We read a couple of verses last week from Jeremiah. I want to start this morning a little bit different than I normally do because I want to read 16 verses from Ezekiel chapter 34. I'm going to put them up on the screen, but if you want to flip to your Bibles, you can. Ezekiel 34. And we're going to start in verse 1. What we're going to see is this. Every time at work and the boss gives you a performance review, you want it to be good, right? You want your performance review to be good. You want to get a promotion. You want to get a raise. You want to, all this kind of stuff. You're always looking for for performance, good performance reviews. God gave the Jewish religious leaders of Israel a performance review in Ezekiel 34, starting in verse 1, and it wasn't very pretty. Uh, They probably made a couple trips to HR over this one. All right, so Ezekiel chapter 34, what does God think about the shepherds of Israel, the religious leaders? Let's read verse one. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth, and no one was seeking or searching for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey and my flock became food for every beast of the field because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God. Notice again, behold, I am against the shepherds. And I will require my flock at their hand, and I will cause them to 
to cease feeding the sheep and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more. And now I want you to know and I want you to see what God starts to say because this is exactly where Jesus is at in John 10. He, <clears throat> he's made some claims against Israel's shepherds and then he's gonna step into the fray and say, but I'm him, I'm the, I'm the one, I'm the shepherd. And this is what God said in Ezekiel 34, for I will deliver my flock from them. You didn't do it, I'm gonna do it, that they may no longer be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and I will bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pasture and their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. There they shall lie down in a good fold and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. If you're getting images of Psalm 23, you should be. This is what good shepherds look like. I will feed my flock and I will make them lie down. Psalm 23 again, says the Lord God, I will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away. Bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick, but I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. Fat and strong, what? Not sheep, false shepherds. He's gonna, he's gonna judge the false shepherds. He's gonna judge the Jewish religious leaders of his people that weren't doing uh, what they were supposed to be doing as shepherds of his people. And so last week, we started to look at the sneak peek. Let me just kind of come back to that slide um, of the connections that Jesus was making. We said last week, we're gonna let Jesus make the connections. We're gonna try to observe them as he's making the connections. But we gave a sneak peek and as I mentioned last week, the sheepfold is Judaism. Now, this is going to come out. You, you'll have to kind of tr- maybe, well, I hate to say that. That's, that's weird. Just trust me on that. But trust me on that. We'll come back and see. There'll, there'll be some more development here in this story. But I believe the sheepfold that Jesus is talking about in verses 1 through 6 is Judaism. Okay? Part of the reason I think that is because of what's revealed in Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, in fact, notice the, the shepherding, even the, the containment language, if you will, But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. In other words, the law was where we were stationed. It pointed to the Messiah. And then when the Messiah came, we were to respond to him. And we were to go out with him, so to speak, out of this contained sheepfold. And it was a safe sheepfold because what did the Mosaic law do? It pointed to a savior. You know, we, we've, we talked to some people yesterday downtown, and one of the questions I always ask is, why did God give the Ten Commandments? And you know, the most of the answer is, or there's a, there's a variation of it, but most people say this, God gave us the Ten Commandments so we knew what rules to keep so that we could go to heaven. And I say, that's the most popular answer I ever heard, but it's actually not biblical. I say, God gave the Ten Commandments to show you that he's holy and you're not. That's actually what he did because it's designed to walk you to Christ because you start looking at the 10 commandments and I don't care who you are. You're not, you're not getting a good evaluation report. You know, I, and I always ask this question. It's crazy. I can be talking to the sweetest homeschool mom. I can be talking to a dude that's tatted from his ears down to his toes. And I can say something to the effect, how many lies have you told in your lifetime? I had a, a real sweet mom yesterday. It was like, oh, too many to count. What's the same answer the other dude gives me? I mean, it's like, we're all condemned when we face a perfect standard. And so this was designed to keep them in place, to show them that they're not perfect, designing to trust in God's solution to make them perfect. See, that's the problem with religion. Religion says, yeah, you're not perfect, but if you try real hard, you can, God's gonna grade on the curve. I hate that. God ain't gonna grade on the curve. God's a perfect God. He lets perfect people into heaven. And if you realize you're not perfect, you got a problem. I got a problem. Nobody's perfect. That's why we need a savior to make us perfect and to pay the consequence of our sin that we deserved. And so this is the beauty of the gospel, but the sheepfold is Judaism. It kept them in uh, safe, if you will, looking forward to the Messiah. And it was designed, if you, you take that sheepfold picture, right? We, we had shepherds that would drop their sheep into a sheepfold. They put a doorkeeper there to sleep in the door, not let the sheep out, not let wild animals in or thieves in through the door. And then the shepherd would come in the morning and what he would do? He'd be like, 
let's go, guys. And they were designed to respond. They responded to their shepherd's voice. And so the sheepfold was designed to do that for the nation of Israel. But the sad thing, as we saw in John 1, is he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. That was what was tragic about this whole scenario. The shepherd, not, not a big guess, that's Jesus. He's going to tell us he's the shepherd in verse 11. So we'll get there this morning as well. You remember uh, that, that there was a doorkeeper. Last week, we looked at the, this concept of, again, we're trying, to, we're trying to bring culture from 2,000 years ago into our modern day. So there's some things we've got to explain to understand context. But back, back in Jesus's day, multiple shepherds would bring their flocks and they would put them in one sheepfold. They would mix their sheep together. Then they would go down and, and sleep and they would hire a man to be a doorkeeper at the door. And his whole, his whole job was to stay in the door. Don't let sheep out. Don't let wild animals in. Okay, you, you're the door, sleep there, rest there. Don't let anyone out or in. That was this doorkeeper's job. And so when you look at Jesus's example in verses one through six, I didn't bring this out last week, but I think the doorkeeper is probably representative of John the Baptist. You'll see uh, down in verse three that the doorkeeper opens the voice to the shepherd. And this is exactly what John the Baptist did. You know, we've entitled the whole series of, of John, Behold the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. That's what John the Baptist said. He was the one who identified the shepherd for Israel. Now, some people responded. Most people didn't in his day. So again, just identifying the pieces, the door we're gonna see is Jesus Christ in verse seven. And that's, that's Jesus mixed in metaphors. You know, they tell you not to do that. But I guess since Jesus did it, it's okay to do that. But he kind of mixes some metaphors here. And we'll see what, why that's significant. There's something I think really unique there. The sheep, obviously, contextually, is, is first and foremost the blind man from John chapter 9. But it's anybody out of Judaism who would respond by faith to the shepherd. And we're going to see down in verse 16, it's anybody out of the Gentile world that would also respond by faith to the shepherd. He's going to say down in verse 16, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, Judaism, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. And then guess what? There will be one flock and one shepherd. Talk about some just deep church Ephesians type truth right there in this illustration of John 10. And then we see that the thieves and the robbers are the Jewish religious leaders. That's who he's identifying there in verse eight. He also mentioned them in the first. And then the hireling, are also the Jewish religious leaders, verses 12 through 13. This is why I believe this illustration is so powerful. Jesus is is literally throwing shade on the Jewish religious leaders, okay? He he is just throwing shade on these guys. He, He is likening them to bad shepherds. He is likening them to men who only have nefarious motives. He is really... Um, coming after these Jewish religious leaders in an aggressive way. And should that surprise us about Jesus? No, just go back and look at John 8 when he said, you're of your father, the devil. He's got no problem dropping some some hand grenades once in a while on these Jewish religious leaders to get their attention. And so he's likening them to all these kind of things. And what we're going to see is Jesus is now going to set himself up, just like Ezekiel 34 did. He's going to set himself up in contrast to the bad shepherds. You are the bad shepherd. I am the good shepherd. I'm not a, by the way, not to spoil the point when we get there, but I'm not a good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd, right? It's very significant, very distinct as we look. All right, so let's jump in. Now that I've introduced the topic, well, let me pray and we can go. But just, no, just kidding. I, we've got more. All right, verse 7. We'll have to actually get in the text here. Verse 7 and 8, then Jesus said to them again, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Now, Jesus uses this phrase a lot in the gospels. Amen, amen is the Greek. Most assuredly, I say to you, I think the King James says, truly, truly, okay? The the idea is you put these two words together And it's just an emphatic way of saying what I'm about to tell you is super duper trustworthy. Like you can take this to the bank. He said it back in verse one. That's how he started the initial illustration that he gave. But now they don't understand. And now he's going to clarify for them. And he says something unique here because immediately if you're reading this through, you expect him in verse seven to say, I'm the shepherd. But he doesn't start there. He starts with, 
I'm the door of the sheep. And by the way, this is another one of those I am claims uh, in, in the book of John. It's just an interesting twist to start his identification. We'll talk about why it's so interesting. What exactly is he saying here and why is that significant? But um, if you don't know, we've got, a, we've got a QR code in our John notebooks that's got a chart with all of Jesus's I am claims on it. So you can kind of check that out. But as we've talked about before, um, it looks like he's just saying, I am the door. And he is saying that. But it's interesting in the Greek because he puts together a phrase that's almost like redundant. He, he says, ego, a me. Literally, I, I am, or I am, I am. And those of us that know the Old Testament, it should immediately trigger our thinking back to Exodus chapter three. Because Moses in the burning bush, he says, uh, God wants to send Moses to the people of Israel. Moses says, who should I say sent me? And what does God say? I am, I am. You tell him I am sent you. He, that's the name he gave to Moses. And when you look at that Hebrew phrase, when it's brought into the Greek, guess how it's brought into the Greek? Ego, a me. The same exact thing that Jesus is saying here. So he could have just said, a me, I am the door. But he doesn't say that. He puts an emphatic extra word in there. Ego, a me, again, drawing our attention back to Exodus chapter three. And there's a little bit of a twist here. And so this identification, I believe, is significant for a couple of reasons. Number one, notice he says he's the door. See how it's articulated? I am the door. I'm not a door. This fits God's imagery all throughout the Old Testament. How many doors were into Noah's ark? One. How many doors were into the tabernacle in the wilderness? One. How many doors were into the temple in Jerusalem? One. There's one entrance in, there's one exit out. And so it just shows God's plan for salvation has always been exclusive. You know, I know that offends the religious mind in our world because they just, all they want is to be accepted as equally valid as Christianity. You know, you'll see those bumper stickers coexist. The problem with that is Christianity cannot coexist with any other religious thought. Every other religious thought is about what you must sacrifice for God Christianity is the only religion that talks about what God has sacrificed for you. It is a total flip on its head upside down. And so we can't coexist in the sense of all views are equal. Now we can treat people with dignity and love and that's what we're called to do. But the message is the message. The door is the door. The shepherd is the shepherd and the gospel is the gospel. There's no other good news outside of the fact that Jesus died for you and rose again. And so we see this even here built in. And that's one of the things that we've got to understand. When God sends a rescue plan, he doesn't have any contingencies. God's not like, well, I better back that up in case this one doesn't work. No, it works. It's Jesus Christ crucified and raised. It works. <laughs> Takes care of our twofold problem. We had a death that we were required to pay, that we earned or deserved. The wages of sin is death due to our sin. We deserve death and hell. Jesus died for you so that you would never have to face that penalty. And the moment the Bible says you trust in him and what he did for you alone, God credits his righteousness or his perfection to your account. Sounds like a, a deal too good to be true, isn't it? That's the definition of grace, basically. You're saved by grace. It's too good to be true. God gives you something you don't deserve. What a, what a blessing to be able to just know and to, and, to, and to communicate that message and live just in expectancy of, of heaven one day, not on the basis of my good deeds, but on the basis of the good deed of Jesus Christ. It's just amazing. Now, he says, we expect him to say he's the shepherd. He's gonna say this too. We get down to verse 11, he's gonna say he's the shepherd. But he starts, uh, to, he starts that he's, he's the door. It's just kind of an odd phrase. Now, why is this significant? There's some reasons for that. One of the things we learn is in a sheepfold, the door was the only way in, the only way out. We've talked about this. This is a picture of an average sheepfold. One door in, one door out. The design was to protect the sheep from getting out, but protect wild animals or thieves and robbers from getting in. And they would often build these walls up and they would put like sharp branch, like barbed wire, but it was like sharp branches and sticks so that nothing could climb in on the side. And as long as that doorkeeper was willing to stay in the door, it worked well. And, and nobody got out and nobody got in. But Jesus says, I'm the door of the sheep. Now the door of the sheepfold led to rest and protection when entering. So the, the sheep would come in at night. 
That's where they would rest. That's where they'd be protected. That's where they would sleep for the evening. But guess what? It also led to life in abundance if you're going the opposite direction, right? Coming in, rest and relaxation, going out, life in abundance to fields and pastures and uh, streams, okay? And so that was the deal. The shepherd would come in the morning and lead them out to abundance, fill their guts. And, and I've heard often that, that one, of the thing about, uh, one of the things you learn about sheep is they're never not hungry. They're always hungry. Um, kind of reminds me of 18-year-old men. Always hungry, right? Second dinner. We have second dinners at our house. I'm not going to call out any names, but we have second dinners at our house oftentimes. And, and this is exactly like sheep. They're never satisfied in terms of eating. You can take them to one field and you got to move them to another and they go out and they just live an abundant life when they have a good shepherd because he's moving them around in that way. Third, the door is the only way the shepherd would come into the sheepfold. You know, he doesn't have to climb over the side. He's the shepherd. He just walks up to the door, right? And so this is what's, what's so interesting about what Jesus says. He's all of these things, as we have delineated here, but notice something even more specific here. He, he makes a shift. I don't know if you caught it. And, and if you didn't, it's okay. These, these are the things we want to observe as we go through the text. Notice he says he's the door of the sheep and he's not the door of the sheepfold. You see how he... It's a little bit of a twist. You're like, huh, is that that really that big of a deal? Well, I think it is because in verses one through six, the door into the sheepfold, I believe, represented the Messiah's proper entrance to the Jewish people. And you know what? Jesus came at the right time. He came in the right way. And not only that, but God told John the Baptist that the one whom you see, the spirit descending upon like a dove, that's the one, identify him. And Jesus came in the right way, in the right manner. He was the shepherd coming to the appropriate door of the sheepfold in the right way. But when we get to verse seven, he shifts the metaphor here because now it's what sheep is gonna go through the right door? Which sheep is going to respond to the shepherd that's now been identified? And so he is not uh, the door of the sheepfold of Judaism, He's the door to the sheep, those sheep that are coming out to the shepherd. It's just an incredible image. And when we get to John 14, 6, it makes a lot of sense. Jesus said to him, this is to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, through the door of the sheep. They've got to pass through this door to the Messiah to be with the Father forever. But here's what I love about this shift. I told you there's a little bit of a twist in this identification. Why is Jesus mixing metaphors? Here's what's really cool. If you remember the story of the sheepfold, what did shepherds do at night? Well, they often took their flock along with maybe two or three other guys, other shepherds' flock. They threw them into the sheepfold. They paid a man to sit in the door, and then they went off and whatever, ate, relaxed, swapped stories, what have you. And they got to take the night off. Guess what? When you have a shepherd who also functions as a doorkeeper, your shepherd never takes the night off. Your shepherd is always with you. And it just breathes life into these phrases that we see in the Bible where God says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Jesus isn't gonna hire some person to sit in the doorway and guard your eternal life. He's gonna sleep there himself. And guess what? Ain't no one getting in and ain't no one getting out. That's how good he is. And this is what we're going to see about Jesus. So he switches the metaphor, which is just, uh, incre- uh, just incredible when you think about it. Now, in contrast to the shepherd, you've got some nefarious characters. And Jesus says it this way, all who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. Very strong statement. Notice he uses the word all. And so thieves and robbers, same exact words used earlier in verses one through six. Um, the, the contrast is this, a thief steals, and they try to steal in secret, okay? This is someone that might break into your house, but they try to make sure you're not home. Like, home, you know, Kevin McAllister style, right? They're, they're thinking the family's out of town. They're gonna get in secretly and get out. That's a thief. A robber is someone who robs you. It's they, they're taking stuff as well, but they're doing it with violence, okay? So you got two different types of people, and you got these existed around sheep in that day. You had people that tried to just kind of get in there and sneak one out of there. I don't know how they did that. They're loud as can be, but sneak one out of there. And then someone would be like, you know, basically take a machete and say, here, get out of the way, doorkeeper, give me three sheep, right? 
That's more of a, like an armed robbery, if you want to say it that way. But Jesus is saying that all that came before him, that's a, that's a huge statement, by the way. All who came before him are thieves and robbers. They were described earlier as climbing up some other way, meaning they don't go through the right door. They won't go through the door. They're always going around the door and over the walls, and they're trying to do something uh, illegally. We're going to see their motive when we get down to verse 10. It's, their reasons are simple, threefold, steal, kill, destroy. That's what they're trying to do to the sheep. They don't care about the sheep. They have no interest in protecting or guarding the sheep. Now, again, who exactly is Jesus talking about? This is what makes this, powerful, uh, this illustration so powerful. He's speaking of and indicting every Jewish leader who came before him as being less than genuine uh, in their leadership of the nation or less than genuine in their shepherding of the nation of Israel. Now, you look back to the Old Testament, we got some great prophets, but you know what? They weren't perfect. They didn't do things the right way all the time. And Jesus is just contrasting. Rather than criticizing some of those men, there, there's a lot of criticism go around. We saw that in Ezekiel 34. But instead of just criticizing some of those men, I think he's elevating himself. He's contrasting himself. Everyone before me wasn't as good as you think they are. In fact, I, I love how the Pharisees will will sit there and they'll hold up Abraham as this great example. Now, is Abraham a great example? Uh, he is. But, it, but are there stories in Abraham's life that we have recorded? You'd be like, ooh, man, I'm blush, man. I was like, There's, it's, it's kind of bad. Like when you got a hero of the Bible and, and you're teaching young kids and you're thinking to yourself, should I skip this story? Because like, this is a little, like it should have a rating on it, right? I mean, it's some of these stories, you're like, goodness sakes, alive. And so Jesus is just saying, Everyone before me was nothing but a thief and a robber. They weren't perfect. They weren't genuine. But guess what? He's also calling out the present day leaders. He, he's basically lumping them in, into, into comparison here. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests, all of these people are less than genuine. They aren't the real deal. And in that sense, there's only one and one person only that will care for the flock in a way that God has designed. And that is Jesus Christ himself. And this is what he's setting up for the contrast. And so these Jewish religious leaders, by the way, they refuse to enter the door. Jesus said, I am the door. They refuse to enter in that way. They did not respond to him as the Messiah. They didn't believe he was the Messiah. They refused to go that way. They thought their way was the, base, the best. And so anyone that wants to be a part of Jesus's flock must go through him, must go through the door, and this is what we're going to see here. But thankfully, as we're going to see at the end of verse 8, the Jewish people, for the most part, did not trust these nefarious characters. Now, some did, some didn't. Again, this is an illustration that Jesus is using. He's not giving all the details played out. But again, it's illustrated for us in the story of chapter 9. Remember the, the Jewish uh, blind man that was healed? He, the more interaction he had with the Pharisees, the less he trusted them the less he listened to them. And so that's an illustration here. And so one of the good things is, is they were not listening to the wrong people. In other words, that, that's a positive thing. They weren't exactly listening to, to the wrong people. They, you know, in this sense, they weren't hearing them. Hearing uh, the word Jesus used here is, is engaged to listening. You know, you, we showed that video last week of the, the sheep out in the field and the different people giving calls uh, to the shepherd. And they would give the same call as the shepherd, but what would the sheep do? If those that were here saw the video, the sheep just kept eating. They just, I mean, they heard it. I mean, the sound hit their eardrums. They weren't engaged though. But the second the shepherd got up and he started doing his call, immediately you see two sheep, their, their heads are down like this. He gives a call and they're like, Phew. their head comes right up. And then the entire field, the head of sheep come up and they all start running over to the shepherd. That's engaged listening. That's what he's saying. He's saying they didn't hear these false teachers or these nefarious teachers. And so in sticking with this analogy, Jesus says the sheep, the Jewish people, didn't listen to the robbers because they weren't their shepherds. This is what he's describing here. Again, it's an illustration. It's not designed to give, uh, it's not designed to give detailed, comprehensive details on everything. Uh, it's just an illustration. But again, this is an indictment of every Jewish religious leader who went before Jesus. And again, there can only be one Messiah, the sheep could only be kept safe within the confines of Judaism until Messiah came to lead them out. And this is exactly what Jesus is illustrating here uh, in this day. Now, the time 
uh, of the Jewish sheepfold was, again, designed to point forward to the Messiah. You go to Daniel 9, and, and Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was predicted to the day, to the day, over 500 years earlier. They should have known. They should have been expecting, looking, anticipating their shepherd arriving, but obviously they didn't. And so Jesus is going to go on to say in verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Again, he restates that he's the door, the one and only entrance. Again, he uses ego a me, okay? This idea that, that he's tying himself back to Exodus chapter three. I am, I am, I am Yahweh. I am Yahweh, your shepherd. I am Yahweh, the door to entrance to eternal life with me. And I love something else Jesus does here. It's, it's subtle. You can't see it. In fact, I didn't even notice it. I, a commentator pointed out, but I just thought it was a really good point. The way that Jesus phrases, I am the door, he puts I up in an emphatic position, which, which the hearers would have heard this. And what he's basically saying, I and I alone am the door. Okay, there's this emphasis here that he's giving. And he says, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Now, if we've talked about that here at church, but there's four different Greek uh, conditional statements. Okay, there's four of them. This is what's called a third class. It's just like ours. If you do it, maybe you will, maybe you won't. If you enter in, there are some good results. You'll be saved. You'll go in and out and find pasture. If you don't enter in, you won't be saved and you won't go in and out and find. So it's conditional in that way. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. And thus we have another illustration of believing in Jesus Christ. He uses a lot of them in the book of John. But here's another one. If you enter by me, it's just an illustration if you, if you believe in me. This is what he's talking about here. And we see that entering through, that's the Greek word dia, is recognizing him as the only acceptable door. It's the only entrance into God's acceptable position. Again, it's very emphatic here. And uh, it, it actually reminds me of a story. There was a, a, a Christian lady who lived in a small town, and in her small town, there was only a Catholic church. She couldn't go anywhere else, so she went to the Catholic church, um, but she was, she was saved. And on her deathbed, the, the priest came uh, to visit with her and to, to give her last rites, and he was trying to encourage her to join the church. He had noticed that she had never joined the church, and he wanted her to join the church because he told her that if she would join the church, that he would pray for her and her sins would be forgiven. This is what the priest told this woman. She replied to the priest, my sins are already forgiven. She, she told him. He was a little shocked. The priest said, don't you know that Peter holds the keys? And she said, yes, but you tell him to keep the keys because I've got the door. And I love it. This is what she's talking about here. Because it's just like 1 John says in his epistle later, that if you have the door, you have life. He says it this way. If you have the Son, the Son of God, you have life. But if you don't have the Son, the wrath of God abides on you. So the question for each one of us is, will you take the Savior? Or do you want to swim your way to safety? Will you take the life raft? Or do you want to swim your own way to safety? And I'm just telling you, no one's swimming their way to safety. It'd be like if I dropped you in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, swim your way to safety, it ain't going to happen. You might get a little farther than the next person, but you're not going to get there. Jesus can save. And this is the message. So you need the door. And this is what Jesus is going to say. Because what happens if you enter by the door? Well, we're going to see two results of entering in. He will be saved. This is what Jesus says. Saved is the the normal Greek word for save, sozo, it means to save, to deliver, to make, or keep hold, to preserve from danger, loss, or destruction. I'm going to get Greek, geeky, Greeky for a second because I think it, it'll bring out some additional points. Saved is future passive indicative. That's the, the form, if you will, the parsing of that Greek verb. It means this. It's a guaranteed promise. When you combine a future and an indicative, and indicative is a mood of fact, out in the future, he guarantees that you'll be saved. He's talking about a future salvation, future salvation from the wrath of God if you simply enter by the door, by faith. You're gonna be delivered. And then you'll notice that passive. You know what that means? It means you don't save yourself. An outside source will deliver you in the future. And by the way, who do you think that is in context of looking here? It's the shepherd. 
It's the door. It's by entering the door, he's going to save you. And in keeping with the, the sheep, sheepfold analogy, if the sheep enters through Jesus the door, then guess what? The sheep would be safe and secure from any kind of robbers or nefarious individuals overnight. By the way, if you enter the door, if a sheep were to enter the door of a sheepfold, he's safe and secure from the robbers because the, the shepherds sleep in the doorway. Guess who else the sheep is safe and secure from? Themselves. <laughs> when you think about it, they're safe from themselves. In fact, the shepherd sleeps in the doorway for just as much reason to keep people out than to keep the sheep from wandering out. And so it's just incredible. The guarantee to be saved is not based on the sheep's behavior ongoing. It's based on the ability of the shepherd to save them. The ability of the the man who's sleeping in the doorway to keep them where they're supposed to be. And he says, I guarantee you, if you enter into my door, you will be saved. You will be saved and I'll save you. Spiritually speaking, we talk about this a lot, but if a person believes in Jesus, they're going to be saved from sin's penalty, and they're going to be saved into an eternity with God. Now, nobody in this room, nobody in this world deserves that. Let's be honest. This is why Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says we're saved by grace, God giving you something that you don't deserve. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. And last time I checked, every gift I've ever received, I didn't have to pay a dime for. But somebody else paid for it in full. Salvation's the same way. Jesus Christ paid for your salvation in full, so he is now free to offer it to you freely with no cost. In fact, if someone came to me and said, hey, I got a gift for you, but you're gonna have to pay me $10 a month for the next 12 months, I'd be like, dude, hit the road. <laughs> I'm not interested in those kind of gifts. That's not a gift, Okay. In fact, that's every sales tactic in the world. It's like, if you buy a car at our dealership, we're going to give you a TV. And I know people go buy a car just to get a TV. I'm like, just go buy a TV. I'm going to save you a lot of money. And by the way, you ain't getting a TV for free. They're working that into the price somewhere. I mean, we know this by now. But salvation doesn't work that way. The, The price has been paid. The debt has been paid in full. The stamp has been slammed down on the invoice Uh, of your sin penalty, it's paid in full. Will you trust in it or not? That's the question. And so second result of entering in, he says he will go in and go out and find pasture. And this speaks of freedom going in and out uh, of the door. Now, it's interesting because it doesn't mean that the sheep come in and out of salvation. You see, this is where that metaphor, you know, they always say metaphors break down at some point. What is he trying to illustrate here when he talks about coming in and out uh, of the door. Well, in keeping with this sheepfold analogy, which is what he's building on, the sheep can come into the sheepfold for safety, but they can go out into abundance and, and, and true living with the shepherd. They can find enjoyment out of the sheepfold as the shepherd leads them out. And this is what it's describing. In fact, in this day, to go in and out was just a common depiction of living life, carrying on with the the daily affairs of life. This is what he's saying. If you enter by me, he's going to expand on it again um, as we get it in verse 10. He's going to say they, they're going to have life. They're going to have safety and security, but they're also going to have abundance. And that's it. One is coming in. One is kind of coming in and going out. And that's what's being illustrated here by Jesus. So not only is Jesus the door leading into safety and security, but he's also the door leading out to abundance. And this is what David meant in Psalm 23 when he said, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. We've talked about this before, but sheep can't swim. So if you lead them by raging rivers, they're not smart enough to just dip their head in and get a drink. They fall in and they drown. So it's imperative that a shepherd knows how to lead sheep beside still waters. Again, that's the other thing you'll see is sheep will never lay down unless they feel safe, secure, and their stomachs are full for that moment. They'll never lay down. But good shepherds make their sheep lay down. They make them rest. And this is all part of how a shepherd cares for their sheep. Now, in contrast to the shepherd, we read about uh, in verse 10, we get a little bit more insight here onto, you know, the the other side of the equation, the the non-shepherds. The thief, he says, Jesus says, does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. 
Now, I want you to notice that word before thief. It's interesting because just as Jesus articulates the shepherd, he's the shepherd, not a shepherd, he's the shepherd. Here in verse 10, he shifts. He's not talking about thieves in general right now, specifically. He's talking about the thief. And who is the thief? This is Satan himself. He's the source of every thief and robber that's ever come before. He is the thief, and, and, and thus he's the source of every thief and robber that's ever come before. Now, notice this. Jesus uses a very interesting negation here. It's, the, it's, it's translated not. It's the Greek word ooh. It's a direct and full negation. It's an objective negation. What that says is there's no contingencies or, or anything that caused this thief to act in any other way possible. This is who he is. He does not come except for the following reasons, to steal to kill and to destroy. What it's saying emphatically is there is no other reason that Satan would ever come to a sheepfold or to a sheep in God's sheepfold other than this reason. And this is why it's so important that as even we prayed for marriages uh, before the message today, even as we prayed for that, as we pray for relationships among family members, this is everything that the enemy is about all the time. And this is why we don't want to let him have a foothold in our marriages or in our families or in our church family, because this is what he accomplishes. He promises the world and he leaves you a, a doo-doo sandwich, basically, right? As we said, uh, the, the friend that would, would, take, would take me and he'd say, hey, just knock on the door. We're going to throw this, this bag of, of dog poop on someone's, uh, you know, on someone's, have I told this story before? Maybe I told it in Liberia. Anyways, um. Do, so you, you t- I, I, why am I giving young people ideas? I'm so sorry, parents. You're gonna have to, you're gonna have to clean this up when you get home. But, but the point is this, I actually had a friend that did that and he said, yeah, you, you just go up, let's light it. We'll light that bag on fire. I'll ring the doorbell and then we'll run. Well, as I'm going to light the thing on fire, he rings the doorbell and runs and I get stuck, stuck there holding the bag. <laughs> Literally, like the, like the phrase says, you get like left holding the bag, right? That's Satan. He promises the world and he leaves you with a bag of poop every single time. This is what the thief does. Kids, do not get any ideas from your pastor. (laughs) Good. No guarantees. All right. All right. You got a lot of work there, my man. Hey, maybe your dad will go with you. I don't know. No, I'll just kidding. <laughs> All right, so he mentions three things. Let's kind of work through these um, that the thief is involved in. And again, the thief is the source of every thief and robber, okay? So we're going to talk about the group, but we're also going to talk about the source. They steal, okay? Thieves steal sheep, sheep, and they do it for a variety of reasons. One is they'll take them and they'll resell them and make 100% of the profit. They had no investment in the sheep. They let them get fat and full and full of wool. And they said, I'm going to take it and make 100% of the profit. Oftentimes, they would shear it for the wool. Sometimes, they would slaughter it for the meat, maybe to feed their family. And then check this out. This is crazy. We're going to see this in the next word, too. They would oftentimes steal someone's sheep and then go offer it as a sacrifice to God in the temple. Total hypocrisy. In fact, that's what the second point brings in. They kill. So they, they see the sheep as just a payday. Once they get what they want out of the sheep, They just eliminate them. They're worthless. The sheep's life and value is worthless to a thief and a robber. And this is what I was bringing out is that the word kill here is the Greek word thuo. It means to sacrifice or to kill and offer in sacrifice. You actually had sheep. I mean, can you imagine sheep thieves stealing sheep and then running over to the temple and sacrificing to God? It'd be like if you steal money. And then you come give it to a church or something. I'm just like, it just doesn't seem to fit. And this is exactly what some of these men would do. And they destroy. The compound word, apulamai, means to destroy wholly or completely, especially in this context. And it just speaks to the heart of the thieves. And this is what we're getting at. We see actions that reveal hearts. With the thieves, we're seeing these actions that reveals their hearts. They don't care about the sheep. Once they get what they need, they discard the sheep like a piece of trash. The shepherd, in contrast, is completely different. We're going to see his heart toward the sheep. And so contextually, Jesus, again, is referring to the false religious leaders in his audience 
while he's speaking this. That wasn't clicking there for a second. However, again, it's, a, it's clear that the source of these activities is Satan himself, who steals, kills, and destroys. Remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees earlier, you are of your father the devil, the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now, in contrast to the thief, we get a, a better picture. Jesus is all about life, and not just eternal life lengthwise, but eternal life quality-wise. And we're going to talk about that. He says, I've come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. So we see Jesus' involvement in the sheep is different. The, th- the thieves just take, 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 nothing left for them to take. Then they discard the sheep. That's their attitude toward the sheep. They extract what they want, then they move on. In contrast, Jesus lives for the benefit of the sheep. And we see here, not only does he provide life, but he also sustains life. He guards their lives and he keeps them alive. Now that's all ways of saying the same thing, but hopefully it hits you at different angles. This is what shepherds do. They don't just uh, provide life, but they guard, they sustain, and they keep people alive. And this is what we've got to understand. And sometimes we don't think this way unless someone points it out. But when we talk about eternal life, it's not that Jesus is just imparting long life. That is true. That is what eternal means when it talks about salvation. But it's also rich life. It's also abundant life. It's not just quantity of life. It's quality of life that he wants to offer. And this is one of the things that we need to understand is that all Christians, everyone who's put their faith in the finished work of Christ, they possess right now eternal life. They possess it. That's length of life. That means they'll never die because Jesus died for them. They'll never face that death penalty because Jesus faced it for them. But you know that not all Christians are enjoying the abundant life. You know, many Christians go around this world and they look more like Eeyore than Jesus Christ. They're, they're complaining and griping about how they can't find their tail. And that's, and that's their Christian life. And quite frankly, if you've ever been around a Christian like that, you don't want to stay around them too long. They're a little depressing. I think I've told a story about a young man, and he used to tell me just like what a rotten sinner he was all the time. And, I, you know, after the first two, three times, I was like, wow, this guy's really humble. After about the fourth time, I'm like, dude, I got to get away from this guy. He's such a downer. And his name wasn't even Debbie, you know, he was just a... Maybe it was Daniel Downer. I forget his name now. But he wasn't enjoying abundant life. It was there for the taking. He had eternal life. He just didn't have or he wasn't enjoying abundant life. And I love the word that Jesus uses here. It's more abundantly means over and above. It means more than enough. It it, it communicates something that's exceptional that you weren't expecting. It's over and above what they expected. And so he's not only concerned about their existence, but he's concerned about the quality of with which they live life. And I love, again, as I said, it reflects his heart. We saw the heart of the the thieves and the robbers. They just get what they can, discard. Here's Jesus' heart expressed more clearly in Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, same word we have right here, do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. And I think when you start throwing adverbs together on top of each other, it's pretty cool right, exceedingly abundantly. And so it's kind of this emphatic way to say that he's over and above. You're gonna have leftovers kind of thing. And not the kind of leftovers you gotta heat up that are stale, but like good leftovers, you know, lots of leftovers that he provides. And so now you'll notice like through verse 10, the the focus has been on the door. Now, as we get to verse 11, he's gonna shift the emphasis to the shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. And we're gonna start finding out why that's the case as we go forward In verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Another I am claim by Jesus, another ego, a me, not lego, my ego, but ego, a me, I, I am, emphatic way, again, tying him back uh, to Exodus 3. And it's loaded. It's, it, this is an absolutely loaded statement that he makes here for a couple of reasons. One, ego a me that we brought out. But two, it would have conjured up a ton of imagery from these Jewish religious leaders with their Old Testament. Bad shepherd, Yahweh is going to be my shepherd. Bad shepherds of Israel, 
Yahweh is the good shepherd. And this is what Jesus is drawing on here contextually. And, and one of the things that we see in Psalm 23.1 is the Jews expected even the Lord to be my shepherd. Now, we've talked about this before, but when you see the, the, the word Lord capitalized in the Old Testament, what word is it translating? It's translating Yahweh. It's, it's translating Yahweh. And Jesus, I believe, is saying, I am Yahweh, your good shepherd. I am the one you've been looking for here. And addition, additionally, and this is kind of cool, if it, 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 these are things that you just wouldn't know unless you kind of slowed down and looked. But I just thought I would share with you, the word good that Jesus uses here is one of two Greek words that he could have used. One uh, emphasizes benevolent beauty. The other one emphasizes just the moral aspects of goodness. That's typically how we use it, the moral aspects. Of, but uh, Jesus uses the word that means beauty here. And you could literally translate this, the beautiful shepherd. It's attractive goodness. It's a attractive beauty. He's beautiful in the sense that his character is beautiful. He's beautiful in the sense that the way he fulfills his job is beautiful. You could say it's just, it's a, it, he's a thing of beauty. Maybe you could say that way. He's a shepherd of just incredible beauty in this way. And this claim, again, that Jesus makes right here should have at once captured their attention. He is claiming to be Yahweh, the good shepherd, the beautiful shepherd, the one that they've been looking for this entire time. And by the way, God had also predicted that a descendant of David would one day shepherd the people of Israel appropriately. He was all of this. He was all of this as he's standing in front of here. Now, as we go forward in this section, even, even starting next week, we're going to see that the main reason, the, the main thing that makes him beautiful is because of what he did. And we're going to see that Jesus here, even in verse 11, predicts his impending death. He says, I am the good shepherd. The shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And I, and I love the phrase that he uses here. He says gives. Now, we typically see that word and we think, oh, he, he gave his life. And, and Jesus did give his life. That's, that's right. But it's interesting. The word he uses here is he sets himself in place for the sheep. That's actually the Greek word. He puts himself in position for the sheep. What is he talking about? Well, I believe he's talking about this imagery that he's been building. I'm the one that sleeps in the doorway. I'm the one that's gonna protect them. I'm the one that's gonna save them. I'm the one that's gonna lead them out. I don't need a doorkeeper. I'm the doorkeeper. I'm the shepherd. And when I wanna lead them out, I'm gonna lead them out. And when I need to protect them, I'm gonna be there to protect them. I'm never leaving them. I'm never forsaking them. And he says, you know what? I'm gonna put myself in that position for the sheep. That's why he's a beautiful shepherd. Because guess what? No one else ever did this. Every other shepherd took nights off. The good shepherd, the beautiful shepherd doesn't take nights off. In fact, we learn in the Psalms, behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Another beautiful thing there is he puts his, his life in place of the sheep. This word for means on behalf of, for the sake of. This preposition is a huge preposition. It's a very meaningful preposition, even if you don't like grammar, which that was me growing up too, but you don't like grammar, this preposition is huge because it often is used to represent the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Him for you. Him getting what you deserve so that you are free to get what you don't deserve. And we see this in Romans 5.8. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There's a preposition who pair. It's right there too. You know, it's so interesting because all throughout the Old Testament sacrificial system, many, many sheep died for shepherds. But now we're looking at a shepherd who dies for a sheep. It's the exact opposite as we see the good shepherd. And so instead of saving himself, we see the good shepherd is always willing to risk his own life. His neck is always on the chopping block in front of the sheep. What a beautiful shepherd we have. David calls him a good shepherd in Psalm 23. Jesus is referred to a, the great shepherd in Hebrews 13. Peter calls him the chief shepherd in 1 Peter. And here in this passage, we have him called the beautiful shepherd. And just what a great shepherd we've got. Let's pray. Lord, I do thank you um, for your word. I pray that as we share this illustration that you are glorified that the work that you accomplished would just resonate in our thinking, make sense, be convincing. 
We pray if there's anyone here today that's never trusted in you alone, that they would see the value of what you accomplished and do that. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.